our next three speakers, uh, really together, I would, I would challenge anyone to find any other three figures, put them together in a room, and find more authority on the great war in the air than, than these three gentlemen. And so we're absolutely thrilled to have them here. I'm going to uh, just mention each of them in the order in which they will appear. Uh, first is Dr. Jack S. Ballard, Emeritus Professor from the U.S. Air Force Academy, a longstanding U.S. Air Force historian who's published a number of books. His newest book is on the 147th Aero Squadron, uh, which actually recently was reviewed by one of our own docents, uh, Steve Ellis, positively. Uh, happy to say, right, Jack? Uh, but reviewed positively, and it's just one of many books he's written on a number of different subjects, both officially for the United States Air Force uh, and on his own. Uh, the book that uh, we sell here that uh, is available is uh, Warbird Ace, a biography of American ace uh, uh, Field Kindley. Uh, an absolutely fascinating book, perhaps not a name that immediately resonates uh, with people, but as I described it to people after I read it, a quintessential story of the type of person who ended up going into aviation uh, in the First World War. Uh, and many of his accomplishments, while unique, in some ways also representative of that time. And it's a, what, what I call a wonderful snapshot of that era and the importance of these early pilots to not only how the First World War turned out, but also to the subsequent development of aviation. So he'll be speaking first. Following behind him will be Dr. John Morrow, professor at the University of Georgia. He's been there 26 years. He's been a teacher for over 43, and he's published over half a dozen books on uh, World War I, so an abs a strong authority on it. His book, The Great War in the Air, is considered one of the seminal books on the subject. And so he will be uh, speaking uh, second. And third will be Dr. Richard Hallian. Dr. Richard Hallian is the Senior Consultant for Air and Space Issues at the Institute for Defense Analysis in Washington, D.C. And I'm sure if you asked him all the things he's done beforehand, he can give you a lot of titles for a lot of different places with long, long names. Uh, but we could go on for a very, very long time. Uh, he's done a number of books on a number of different subjects uh, in aviation. I forgot to bring his most current book. Which the most current book on World War One you've done, Dr. Hallian? I forgot to bring it up here. Actually, that was Rise of the Fighter. That was years ago. Oh, okay, Rise of the Fighter. That was years ago. He was gonna he's gonna wrap everything up. Uh, this afternoon, uh, talking more broadly about the issues that will be brought forward. So what you have here, ladies and gentlemen, are three of the finest minds and most accomplished scholars on World War I aviation anywhere in the world here in front of you for the next 90 minutes. So to go ahead and start that off, with no further ado, I'd like you to welcome to the Museum of Flight Dr. Jack Ballard. Well, good afternoon. Before I begin my um, subject talk, I would like to first of all say um, that uh, I appreciate being a participant in a, such a group that's so distinguished. I have some really distinguished colleagues and I really appreciate that opportunity. I feel very humble, very honored, and very privileged. The second thing, uh, I would like to um, thank uh, the staff, uh, JD in particular, uh, for the hospitality that um, the staff and the museum here have extended to me, and I'm sure the others uh, feel very much the same. It has been a very, very f fine and warm welcome. And I, I would hurry on to say that as a Denver Bronco fan, <laughs> This was much more pleasant a welcome than what uh, the Broncos received from the Seattle Seahawks in the uh, Super Bowl. So I appreciate that. The third thing is um, a comment on your museum. Uh, I am a volunteer at the um, Wings Over the Rockies Museum in Denver and um, we are a long ways away from where you are. And uh, so I want to commend you for an outstanding facility and spectacular exhibits. I, I think you've really got a wonderful, wonderful place here. So having said that, uh, I would um, like to talk on the subject of um, 
World War I aces, some unlikely heroes. And um, first of all, I'd like to uh, call your attention to um, a magazine article, uh, actually the July 2014 issue of Aviation Week. Colonel Boyne, Walter Boyne, has an article in that magazine entitled, Badass Pilots, Are They a Vanishing Breed? Badass Pilots. I read that and I thought to myself, why that, just that term conjures up really interesting images. And um, I, I, I think it would be a fascinating thing to do a poll in this group uh, today and just find out what does, what is your image of World War I aces, World War I pilots? And um, Colonel Boyne is, uh, I must, must hurry on to say that Colonel Boyne is writing this article to really correct what he sees as a lot of political correctness in the military and specifically Air Force. And he, he's concerned about that. And he, he's concerned about um, conformity. And he goes on in this article, he, interestingly enough, he, he starts off focusing on Eddie Rickenbacker. And he says, Eddie Rickenbacker was a man who uh, took great risks. A man who, as he says, did everything possible to win. He talks about, of course, that uh, he was not uh, educated and he was not an Ivy Leaguer like so many of the World War I pilots. Eddie Rickenbacker, as you just heard in the talk, uh, had so many problems. He didn't, uh, uh, he was kind of shunned by some of those Ivy Leaguers, evidently, and uh, Colonel Boyne points that out. He says he's a risk taker, he's bold. He does things. And he uses uh, uh, certain, certain terms. He, he says, well, you know, he, he, he's, he's kind of like a fighter pilot. So the question, you know, comes up, well, what, what is a fighter pilot? What is he supposed to be doing, you know? What is, what is he? And what is your image of him? Well, we all have, I think, uh, a, a particular image, and I'm not sure whether the term badass pilot is the one or not. But Dan Hampton, in his brand new book that's just come out on the Lords of the Sky, he also begins, to, by the way, he's a fighter pilot who's writing about fighter pilots. And uh, he has a whole section that begins on World War I. And he talks again about risk taking. He talks again about people who are not conformists. He talks about people Pilots that are aggressive, pilots that are risk takers. So I think uh, it's, it's interesting to see what these people see as a World War I fighter pilot. And as I would, as I say, I'd challenge you to, to come forth and tell me, what, what is your image? Of this, of this pilot. Is it a person who is a risk taker? Is it a person who uh, is um, a woman chaser, a hard drinker? Uh, I think that um, uh, Dan Hampton in his book says hard flying. Well, I'm not sure I know what hard flying is, but it's a kind of an image 
of what we have about these men. And Eddie Rickenbacker uh, kind of fits in that. Uh, Colonel Boyne again, he, he takes not only Rickenbacker, but he also mentions Billy Mitchell, and also he talks about um, Doolittle. He says Doolittle was wild. He had this wild streak. Did you know that? See, he talks about how that, he was a wild person. And he said he, he had uh, a few drinks occasionally. And he also had a few flirtations occasionally. So he talks about that. Well, you see what I, I think is happening there are these images of who are these people. So, the, but the purpose of my talk is actually to have you think about some unlikely heroes. And of course you might suspect that I would talk about uh, uh, people that I know and write about. And the first one of course is, uh, as uh, J.D. mentioned, Captain Field E. Kinley. Captain Kinley ended up the fourth ranking American Ares in World War I. Very little known about this man, but he had a very high rank and he had 12 victories and um, so he ranked up very high. But the interesting thing about Mr. Kinley, let me tell you just a little bit about his background. First of all, he was born in the Ozarks of Northwest Arkansas, and that's where I come from. And he was born of uh, two teachers, but his mother died when he was two. And his father shortly thereafter took a job as a teacher in the Philippine Islands and he leaves. Little Field Kinley is then raised by grandmother and some aunts. Very dis separate, very tough family situation. And his father asks for him to come uh, to the Philippines, and actually that's where he gets most of his education, evidently, and I suppose being uh, having a father teacher that he's, as we would say today, uh, he's homeschooled. And so that's a little bit of his background. And then he comes back to Arkansas, and he goes to the, the same little town where I grew up, Gravit, Arkansas. And he goes to school there, and everybody thinks Field Kinley is a wonderful individual. In fact, there are quotes that say, Field Kinley was a golden boy. He, everybody liked Field Kinley. But you know, there's some interesting things about him. He didn't ever show much initiative. He was not athletic. He evidently showed no interest in mechanics. He did not know tools. And he drops out of high school. He's a high school dropout. When he goes to Kansas, in Coffeyville, Kansas, I went there to do a lot of research, and an uh, interesting place, and um, he ran a movie project uh, uh, there for a theater for a good while. Then he decides to enlist in a um, National Guard unit, and uh, he very soon dislikes that. He says, that's not for me. So he does volunteer, as so many others did, uh, and got into the air service. And like so many of the others, he struggled finally in his pilot training. He was not very successful as a pilot. But one of his characteristics was he was persistent. Maybe that's one of the characters, characteristics we see in most of our pilots. But Field Kinley 
was conforming. He was not a maverick. He was not a risk taker. And Phil Kinley finally gets introduced to the British training and he goes to uh, Great Britain and he's trained there and, uh, primarily in his flying and um, he ends up as one of the Sopwith Camel pilots. And uh, hearing the talk uh, earlier about the camel, uh, all of that just came back so much as to what he struggled with in trying to learn to master that aircraft. And he did it. But I would hold out to you that he did not have seemingly that ability to do it. He didn't seem to have the characteristics to do it. He wasn't a risk taker. And he wasn't overly aggressive, but very solidly this man he becomes a flight leader in the 148th Air Squadron, Aero Squadron. And he becomes not only a good pilot, but he becomes a fighter. Dan Hampton, in his book, uh, in his epilogue, he says, one thing is clear. It's very different to just fly the aircraft and fly and fight. And he makes a big point of that. And I think that's very true. So, Kinley becomes a flight leader and here's this man, as I said, that didn't have seemingly all the characteristics that we think about, and a badass pilot. And yet, he worked in cooperation with people. He was exceedingly well-liked, evidently he was very popular, but he had his skills as a pilot, as a, a sop with camel pilot. And so what eventually emerges, uh, and uh, I'll just, uh, I don't quite uh, want to talk, of course I can't go on to talk about every little detail, but I'll just give you a couple examples here toward the end of his, uh, his career. First of all, on September the 28th, when he earns uh, his 11th victory, and at that time he also gets his Distinguished Service Cross. He not only uh, shot or uh, tried to shoot down a balloon, but he attacks some German machine gun nests on the ground. He attacks some German troops that were in formation. He dropped some bombs. And then, to top it all off, he then shot down an enemy aircraft, a German aircraft. And then, with his ammunition exhausted, he sees some Fokkers on, an in, on a, a fellow aircraft there, and he dives down to try to bluff them away, and he's successful. And then a month later, October 28th, Field Kinley reaches the peak of his abilities, and that is that he lays a trap for the Germans. And he very carefully plans all of his operation in which a flight, which he's in command, and he's the ranking flight commander at this point, he is the decoy, and he's got the two other flights above. And he carries out this masterful plan of operation, finally luring seven Fokkers to come down to attack. And the top flights are there, and they swoop down. All seven Fokkers are destroyed without a loss to the 148th at that point. And that's his 12th victory. Okay, so 
what was this man with all of those disadvantages, all those lack of uh, characteristics? That's how he ended up. And so what I would offer to you is this man is a very unlikely hero. Second uh, man that I would like to offer to you is in, in my second book, uh, or a more recent book, on the history of the 147th Aero Squadron. And what we find here is uh, another unlikely hero. And this is Lieutenant Wilbert W. White, Jr. Lieutenant White ended up with eight victories and was the ranking ace in the 147th Squadron, whereas Kinley was the ranking ace in, the, uh, uh, in his squadron as, as the 148th. So the, both of these men are top notch. Let me tell you just a little bit about uh, Lieutenant White. Lieutenant White, when he enlisted, which so many did again, he was 28, older than most, and he was married, had two children, his little girl was deaf. And when he told his wife that he was planning on enlisting, she said, no way. You are a father, you have children, your responsibility is here with us. Your responsibility is to here. And um, his uh, mother was very much the same way. His father, mm, so and his younger brother said, oh, I think it's a wonderful idea. And um, then when Lieutenant White, or uh, at that time just uh, Wilbert White says to his wife, he says, oh, and by the way, I'm thinking that I want to go in the air service. And she became hysterical. So that's how he began. He does enlist. And he goes on, and he has more trouble than Phil Kinley did in his flying. In fact, I wanted to, uh, if I can find it here, he has this uh, amazing uh, quote, which um, uh, at the time um, he said um, his instructor, flight instructor, when he was in flight training, said that he admired my gentle, caressing touch on the controls and that he drives like an old woman, and that his instructor says, he is sure that I will make a good, good flyer when the, they design planes that will fly and land themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of man that he struggled with. Actually, Lieutenant White got special instruction. Uh, he First is flying the Newport 28, eventually, uh, and then uh, finally the SPAD 13. But Lieutenant White was not a risk taker. Lieutenant White was not particularly aggressive. But Lieutenant White was very respected and very, very much admired in his flying skills eventually. And let me tell you what Lieutenant White did. In his, which was really his eighth victory, and it's a very sad one, Lieutenant White was um, leading his flight, and he had a new pilot in his flight, Lieutenant Cox. And Lieutenant Cox uh, was uh, kind of trailing behind a little farther than he should have. And um, sure enough, a German appears behind him, this Lieutenant Cox. White 
realizing that he's in real trouble. Besides, he's got to do something about this, and so he turns and, and does complete reversal and comes back head on and crashes into the German. And both aircraft crash, and of course, in a horrific uh, uh, situation there. Interestingly enough, Rickenbacker observed this, uh, this crash, this, this sacrifice that White did for his, um, his uh, new man. He, uh, Rickenbacker, proposed a Medal of Honor for uh, Lieutenant White, but he never did receive that. He was given uh, the Distinguished Service Cross uh, in, in lieu of it. But what I would offer to you is, uh, by the way, I think with my colleagues, that um, there, the, the, in the combat, one of the things that I have noticed is that when there's a new pilot, this causes untold problems. But what I see is that most of these leaders and most of these aces are always willing to sacrifice themselves to the safety of this new man. I think sometimes we, we need to study, uh, we need to know this a little more, we need to analyze this a little more. And I always admire these people who are willing to do that, to take that sacrifice. And uh, uh, John Ross uh, is interested in leadership and so am I. I think the, the, the leadership is, why do, why do they do this? So I guess I would leave you with uh, just a couple of thoughts, however. And one is that there are some things that you begin to find as you do in talking and in writing and in researching about these aces that are, are interesting. One is that gunnery is of extreme importance to them. They take care of their weapon. And as many of them would say, uh, and was recorded in, in the materials, was, well, you may fly, but you may not fire very well. You may not use your gun very well. And it makes a difference. So what it was important to them was gunnery. And you have to say that they did have aggressiveness when it came time for the battle. And they knew how to do that. Now, Dan Hampton also mentions another word, or another term, and he says most of the aces have situational awareness. And I find that's true. Most of these men were aware of the situation that they were in. And that's more, there's a lot of complexity to that. It's not just a simple statement, but they actually knew that. And the pilots are persistent. And many of them uh, would come in, and their approach was, in so many cases of the aces, was to don't fire till you're right there at the aircraft. And so there are some common things that begin to appear in these. And I'll leave you with the last one, and that was, again, what Dan Hampton writes about. And he says that um, there's a fighting spirit that there's a fighting spirit in these people. I also kind of find that. I find that when they're in the combat situation, they're totally engrossed and they're in there to, for, to finish the fight. But think about what is your image of the World War I fighter pilot? Is it a badass pilot? Is that who you think are the ones that really are the ones that do it? But I hope by talking about two people that I have written about, Captain Field Kinley and Lieutenant Wilbert W. White, that there are these other aces that were not really 
the kind of a person. And they were, to a great extent, conformists. So oftentimes I kind of think maybe we need to just step back and really think about who are these people. And, and each one, of course, is an individual, but there are some common characteristics that we can find. Thank you very much. I'm having a great deal of fun. I, I hope the rest of you are. This has been really a, a very pleasant uh, couple of days. Um, the group of us who've been invited have also been having uh, a reasonable amount of fun. We try to keep it to a limit, but um, we've had some interesting limousine questions that have, I'll just digress for a second to show you what kind of group we do form because we were coming over from the double tree and JD made the mistake of putting me in charge. <laughs> and uh, I've been a department head and a dean, but I have a streak in me uh, that the first time the limo pulls up and Jack Ballard and I are there, and you can see Jack and I are pretty mild-mannered types. Um, went out and said, oh, are you the limo to the Museum of Flight fellow? said, yes. I said, good. So we got the limo, all of us got in the limo, we got here. And then it turns out that probably wasn't the right limo. Uh, at that point, John Ross turns around, looks at me and says, he commandeered that limo. I said, I feel like a chump. I think that guy was waiting for someone else and we took their limo. Um, this morning when we got ready to come in the limo, um, the question was raised again because there's a fellow outside in a Lincoln that looked like the limo. And we go over to him and it turns out, no, that's actually his Lincoln. It's not a limo at all. <laughs> at, at which point um, I was tempted to, and I refrained from it, but I was going to say to him, uh, promoting Jack from civilian to general. General Jack Ballard here needs to get to the Museum of Flight immediately, and we are commandeering your car. Um, <laughs> we didn't do it. So I must say, uh, I repeat all the thanks people have said, but don't think that we are not having a great time together talking about what we write about, what we think about it, and just sort of sharing ideas. This has been a wonderful time. This is a wonderful exhibit. I must compliment the museum. I think this is the best World War I exhibit I have seen in recent years. That includes uh, the museum I actually helped do the World War I exhibit many years ago, the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, but among many others that I've seen, this is absolutely top-notch, so it's worth it to visit it. Now, I'm going to try to step back a little. We've been talking a lot about aces. Um, that's usually what most folks do because the aces are the icing on the cake. They are the individual heroes in a mass war of attrition where millions of men are fighting. When you think about the numbers of men in the air, the air services are quite huge. There are over 100,000 men, some 200. The British Air Service is nearly 300,000 men at the end of the war. And I remember most of those are ground crews. It takes 10 men to get one man into the air. But these are very huge military branches. And what we see during the First World War, as Javier has mentioned earlier, is this incredible technological development of the airplane. And so I'd like to spend a little time on the planes and the engines themselves before I talk about the people that flew them because we often miss this. This is a, a major undertaking in which you have to have the military, 
working with and mobilizing an industry from its very fragile embryonic origins until you reach the point where by the end of the war you have countries mass producing airplanes and engines. And what we often forget, especially because we're often more oriented towards the Second World War than the First World War, is that the country that is the leading producer of airplanes, but most particularly the heart of the airplane, the engine, is France. We always think of the United States as the arsenal of democracy. In World War I, the United States is incapable of building its own combat aircraft. We are so far behind everyone else. We have to borrow planes from everyone else. The one thing we did have was, as we like to tout it, the 400 horsepower Liberty engine. But what nobody will tell you is that you cannot put the Liberty engine in a plane of that time and run it at full power or it will tear the plane apart. So that you have to use the Liberty at partial throttle at all times. But it's worth it just to keep in mind. That's why all of our aces, our pilots are flying, might be, as you pointed out, we've got the Newports, we've got, if they're in the British, the Royal Air Force, the Flying Corps and the Royal Air Force, there'll be in Newport 17s, they'll be later on in Camels, they'll be in SC 5As, they may be in Bristol fighters. Um, if they're flying for the French, they'll be in Newports and SPADs. And if they're flying recon, they'll fly Salmson um, 2A2s. And if they're flying bomber missions or bomber reconnaissance, they'll be flying Breguet 14. Um, these are some of the classic airplanes of the war. We know a great deal about the Germans. You're aware of Falker and the Falker progression from the Eindecker or the monoplane all the way through biplane, triplane, biplane with the Falker D7, which is still often considered the best fighter of the war because of its high altitude characteristics, to the Falker D8, which is the E5 monoplane, which is a harbinger of the future in terms of slim profile, beautifully done, but it's too late. The Germans have this wonderful knack in both world wars for being technologically advanced in the First World War, it's in aircraft and airframe production. But the problem is that they invariably find themselves outmatched quantitatively and occasionally qualitatively by everyone else. And in the end, they are in a rush. They develop all these actually quite spectacular airplanes, but they're too few to make any difference. And anyone who knows the Second World War the Second World War is a replay of the first in that sense. So let's take a look for a minute. When you start the war, the engines that you have, you have the rotary, and Javier explained that very, very well this morning. But you notice he's talking about early in the war, there's 70 and 80 horsepower. And these really are works of, I mean, I consider them beautiful. Uh, I have an issue about World War I planes. I admit to it, and I admit to it about the engines. I think they are exquisite. But the engines are works of mechanical art. To machine a rotary takes a craftsman, a skilled craftsman, who gets a block of metal. It will take him a substantial number of hours. They are not standardized engines. You can't replace the pistons in them. But they function, and they function beautifully. The right engine is very heavy for the horsepower it delivers. A gnome rotary is so much lighter, and it delivers so much more horsepower than the right engine did. And so in the early planes, you might be able to carry one person barely two, but the engine horsepower limits you. But it's worth it to remember that in France, 
One thing the French have that only one other country has is the automobile industry. But the automobile industry in the United States makes standardized engines, and they do it with unskilled labor. The French automobile industry works on the basis of handicraft talent and craftsmen. But the key is that what kinds of engines do they develop? All right, Gnome and Rhone, those are rotary engines. Salmson engines, these are not automobile manufacturers. The Salmson is a radial. And for those of you who might keep up with World War II aircraft, uh, when you look at radial engine planes like the Corsair, which is a brute, um, the radial is an air-cooled engine. Uh, marvelous, it's sturdy, it's reliable. That's what powers the Salmson. And so it's a very difficult plane to bring down, and crews love it because of its sturdiness. We often think about fighter pilots, but the key crews in the war are the observation crews. That's why the fighters appeared, to defend those crews and later to protect them and protect the bombers. And then the fighters became an instrument in and of themselves. Samson, Renault. Now, we all know Renault is an automobile manufacturer. By the end of the war, the Salmson radial is going to deliver 200, 270, 280 horsepower. The Renault 12 cylinder will deliver 300 horsepower. It's what powers a Breguet bomber at speeds of over 120 miles an hour at high altitude and makes it almost impossible for German planes to shoot it down because it goes so high and so fast that only a Fokker can get to altitude with it, but it can outrun a Fokker at altitude. So these are the kinds of things you have to keep up. This is development. The French are going to supply themselves the ultimate engine, the Hispano Suiza. This means Spanish Swiss which was originally both Spanish and Swiss. Its key engineer, Mark Birkett, is a genius, who in 1915-16 designs the first V8 water-cooled engine. It has an aluminum water jacket over the pistons to cool the engine, and it delivers 150 horsepower. You put that in the first version of the SPAD. It's going to match up well with the German Albatross, which is the fighter of the time. But the key to the engine development is by the end of the war, the Hispano Suiza is delivering 200 to 220 horsepower in a geared version. And then at the very end, it is delivering for the future 300 horsepower engines. The French, in other words, are the key to entente victory in the air because the British have a problem. They copy French engines. The only thing that they can actually do well, and what else would you expect, is Rolls Royce. But Rolls-Royce builds heavy engines for heavier planes. The Eagle and the Falcon are marvelous engines. The Eagle will rise to 300 horsepower, be up engine from 200 to 300 horsepower, will power um, day bombers, heavier planes. But you put the Falcon in a Bristol fighter, what's called the Brisfit, the, 2A, 2F2B, F2A, two-seater, high-altitude recon fighter that can be flown like a single-seater and whose pilots and crews swear that it is more than capable of taking on any German single-seater in the sky, including the Fokker D7. It's that engine that enables that plane to do that well and they'll be flying brisfits into the 1930s. They're that good and that stable. So keep in mind, 
Uh, the French built 88,000 aero engines in the war and loan many of them, give many of them to the British. The French will build 52,000 airframes. The British and Germans will each build 41,000. In other words, the French outproduce both of them. And so the French are the key to Entente victory. They give us our planes, our, their engines, they supply us with that, they train our pilots. The British, when the British engines aren't breaking down, they basically try to emulate the French. They take the Clergé rotaries, look at them, and a fellow by the name of Lieutenant William Bentley uh, decides to create a British rotary with aluminum pistons. And the Bentley rotaries, which will power the later snipes, the SOP with snipes, will deliver up to about 230 horsepower, but a rotary can't deliver much more because there's too much wind resistance from the spinning pistons. So these are the planes and the engines. The engine is the heart. Now around that, you can build more and more powerful planes, better armed, capable of carrying bombs as well as heavier crews, in other words, more than two men. Um, so as the war develops, you're going to get I've mentioned some of them already. If you start with the fighters, you, know, you can begin with a Falker Eindecker, but by the end of the war, you are looking at spads, which is a brick. It's built very solidly. Um, it is France's first line fighter. Aces like Charles Guinemer, who is the darling of France. Uh, we were talking about who's a badass fighter pilot. Uh, badass doesn't mean much to me in this context. I like Jack Ballard's presentation. Uh, fighter pilots vary in temperament. They are all very tenacious. They have to be aggressive and take the initiative in combat. Uh, some of them are outstanding flight leaders. Others of them want nothing to do with anyone else. They want to fly alone. And that sometimes leads to their demise as the war continues because it's a mass war of attrition in the air. But they're all different kinds of personalities. If you look at someone like von Richthofen, uh, Richthofen has the pleasure to come on when the first albatross comes on, which is superior to any allied fighter. It's streamlined, the fuselage is a semi-monocoque built out of plywood that is incredibly sturdy. The Allied planes rely on engine power to increase their performance. The Germans are stuck with the six-cylinder in inline engine because they can't afford to experiment because they have material and metal shortages. And so they have to improve those engines, but they set some limits on the planes. The Albatross is a beautiful example, and you see them upstairs, of streamlining a six-cylinder air-cooled engine into a plywood airframe that is solid and sturdy. It's shark-like, beautifully streamlined, and Richthofen rises on the Albatross series, but then gets caught later on in 17 and early 18 when Albatross has seized a monopoly, practically, of fighter plane manufacture in Germany. Nobody wants to build Falkers anymore after the demise of the Falker E3, and he's unreliable because his planes have a tendency to, shall we say, be less than serviceable. They have all kinds of problems. It will actually take von Richthofen, who is angry by the time he returns, he's shot in the head, he's flying the later version Albatross, and he writes this letter to a friend of his that says, you know, it's no more fun being a fighter pilot. This is from the uh, Air Ace of Aces of the First World War. He says, kein Spaß mehr. What's the problem? Our mounts are outclassed by all the Allied fighter planes. Camel turns circles around it. The SC-5A, the comparison plane to the uh, Sopwith Camel, is a stable airframe, 
It's called the British SPAD because it flies with a Hispano Suiza engine. It'll do 120, 130 miles an hour, and that puts it with the SPAD as the fastest of the two of the fighter planes in the war. So Albatross can't stay with them. Bristol fighter flies rings around us. We need a new plane, and fortunately, Richthofen has the clout to be able to get a fighter competition at which Falker will then start re-emerging uh, with a triplane, which is sort of an interim model, a very capable, very maneuverable, very slow, but perfect for a force in the defense, but most critically, the Falker D-7. And why is the D-7 so good? Uh, it has an high-altitude BMW engine in it, but the key is the airfoil. Most Allied planes have very thin airfoils. That means the higher the altitude, the less bite the airfoil has and the less maneuverability. The Falker was a slick operator. He took from Hugo Junkers and Prandtl. Hugo Junkers actually develops the first all-metal airplanes that are used in the war and then later the first viable all-metal transports. He's interested in all-metal aircraft. The German authorities paired him with Hugo Junkers, Junkers and Falker together. It didn't work out very well. Uh, Junkers built an all-metal attack craft and then later fighter. The attack craft is a marvelous specimen. It's a brute. The J-1, the German crews affectionately call it a Möbelwagen, which means furniture van. But you can't shoot down a furniture van. That all metal fuselage protects those crews from anything, anytime. You can throw anything up at it you want. You can shoot anything down at it. You can't bring it down. Um, but what he takes is the thick wing and the internal bracing. So if you go upstairs and you look at the Falker D7, you'll note that it has none of those bracing wires you saw all over that camel that you see on all the Allied aircraft. None of that. It's all inside. It's a thick wing. Much better airfoil. The bite at high altitude is superb. And what the Falker can do, as they say, it can make an excellent pilot out of a mediocre one. At high altitude, it can hang on the prop because the wing is thick enough to give it bite at high altitude. So one of the key maneuvers of a Falker is to come up behind you if you're moving at reasonably high altitude, hang on the prop underneath you so you don't ever even see it and then riddle you with bullets from the underside and then dive away after it shoots you down but it has the advantage of all the allied fighter planes because of that ability to maneuver at high altitude. And so you see a seesaw war. If you're actually looking at observation planes, the Germans have marvelous ones. And what the Germans do is very different from the allies. If the allies want to do observation, they send over a group of observation planes protected by fighter planes. The Germans will send one observation plane over the lines. How can they get away with this? The crews are incredibly experienced. The planes have high altitude compression engines that it doesn't mean that they're extremely fast, but by God, they can get up to 20,000 feet. And at 20,000 feet with an oxygen bottle, it's still dangerous to fly. But what they do is they come over the lines. Rumpler C7s are a good example. Two-seat, single-engine biplane. At top speed, they know they're going to lose altitude as they take their photographs, which are very sophisticated uh, Leica apparatuses. Take the photos, come back. They will gradually lose altitude. But even by the time they come back over the lines, they are still higher than most Allied fighter planes can reach. So they can afford to send one plane with one crew. The Allies can't because they can't get that high. And in fact, there's one anecdote. 
Billy Bishop, who is now, Bishop would probably be considered a badass. But to this day, there's a big argument about whether Billy Bishop didn't lie about how many planes he shot down. So there are other characteristics of the badass in there you might not want to deal with. Someone like Rick Toffin is a straight operator. He's a killer. He hunts in the air. His brother Lotar is more of a wild man um, who flings himself around the air with great abandon. Uh, the older Lotar condemns, uh, the, the younger Lotar thinks the older brother's kind of, you know, geez, by the book. The older brother looks at him and says, you're a wild man, you're gonna die. Well, as we know, Lotar didn't die until after the war. If you look at the two great French aces, Guy Nemeur, the idol, he's idolized by all Frenchmen. When he flies, he flies to kill, and he will take any risk to do this. But the greatest of the French aces, who never gets the same renown, Guy Nemeur is shot down with 53 airplanes in 1917, and French school children are told he has flown so high he can never come down. That is a lie. They all come down, as I read earlier. They just couldn't find his body because he came down in the battlefield, in the middle of the battlefield. The greatest French ace, René Fonck, and the allied ace of aces, shoots down 75 German planes. But Falk never captures the French imagination because he likes to take no risk. He gets high, he ambushes you, shoots you down, and disappears. That's it. So what you have to keep in mind is that this is a melding of man and machine, of engine, airframe, and pilot. And they all come together. And depending upon when you come to the front, when you appear, what your skills are, and your temperaments can vary immensely, you may be very, very successful, or you may be very, very dead. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Before I uh, begin my own presentation, I'd just like to say, like the other speakers have, it's a pleasure getting back here. I, I fully concur, in fact, uh, with what John said. I think the World War I Aviation Gallery here is absolutely a delight. It's the finest I have ever seen. It's very, very well done. I've come uh, back to this museum off and on for maybe the last 20 years, and each time it's gotten a little bit better. And, and frankly, uh, the staff that work here uh, obviously uh, can take not only great pride in what they've done, but they've uh, we certainly owe them a great deal of thanks for the tremendous, tremendous dedication uh, that they have shown in, in bringing this institution to where it is. And uh, another thing, frankly, I'm, I'm delighted that on a topic that seem, seems as obscure as World War I, we have such a large audience, so I appreciate very much that you took time out of your own lives uh, to show up with us today. Now, <clears throat> we had two very fine presentations before mine. I'm kind of like the uh, cleanup batter, if you will, uh, before I get into my own presentation, uh, I think that uh, Jack raised some very interesting points, and that is if you take a look at fighter pilots, they really do represent a diversity. You can't define them as any one particular kind. And as John pointed out very well, <clears throat> that if you take a look at the fighter pilots in the war, uh, whether they survived or did not survive depended on a number of factors, what they were flying, what the tactical and strategic situation was at the time, what their own inclinations were. My own work leads me to tend to believe that if we characterize the fighter pilots of the First World War, we find basically three kinds. We start out with lone wolves, the kind who basically go out uh, and, and do solo patrols and things of that sort, and most of those get shot down uh, in the 1916-17 uh, time period because the tactics are already changing. A new kind of pilot is emerging, and that is the shrewd individualist. The shrewd individualist really characterizes most aces. They, they have lone wolf tendencies, but they realize they have to fly with a pack. They have to fly with some people they really trust. And you find whether you're looking at British or French or German squadrons, you find that there will be 
a, a, a number of these aces that have a best buddy that they kind of work with all the time or a couple that they work with all the time. Those squadrons typically have very high attrition rates of newbies. The newbies come in and they're just flushed out of the squadron very, very quickly unless they're lucky or unless they're very, very good. The third kind of pilots are probably the most valuable to the process. They're also the rarest. And those are the ones that are the tacticians and trainers. They, are, they have respectable individual scores. People like Berkey, Lufberry, uh, Mick Manick, certainly. They have respectable scores. There's no question about their own abilities, but they're more interested in how the squadron functions as a unit. And so they put a lot of time into training their people and working with their people, giving them what we would consider red flag type training today to get those, the, the newbies first, through their first five or 10 missions to the point that they're, they're savvy over the lines. Rickenbacker in his uh, Fighting the Flying Circus talks about going out with Lufberry and Lufberry taking the people under the wing and bring them back after their first patrol and saying, you know, uh, what did you think of your first patrol? And they all nodded and said, Jesus, really kind of interesting, yeah. He said, did you see any airplanes? No, they didn't. And Lufbury says, well, actually, the reason we turned back is because there were a group of enemy aircraft ahead of us, and there were a group over here, and we had reconnaissance aircraft going out over there. And they suddenly realized, God, you know, this really is a complex business. Uh, one, point, um, one point that I think is very important was a point that has been brought up, and that's situational awareness. In the flight test community, uh, there was a very strong distinction between fighter test pilots and fighter pilots. The two aren't the same. There's people that fly fighters, there's people that are fighter pilots, and the twain, uh, the twain uh, re only rarely meet. Okay, enough on that, and we're gonna address more on that in the Q&A. What I'd like to do today uh, is talk about a couple of things. First of all, World War I in kind of a uh, strategic context and what it's meant to us in terms of this century, uh, where the aerospace revolution fits in that, what it teaches us in a way about military innovation, and what it teaches us about the application of new military technology and technological outcomes. And so first of all, uh, I'd say that uh, if we take a look at the war, it was really a product of something that's innate in humanity going back thousands of years, and that's uncertainty. Human history is, is an uncertain history. Uncertainty runs through our entire history. And because of uncertainty, you have a natural state of instability. Now, many people may disagree with what I say, but my personal belief is that all societies are inherently unstable. They're stick fix stable. They like to sop with camel, basically. You have to always maintain your hands on the controls. And as a result, they tend to go through societal disconnections that actually we can look at almost in flight control terms. These are long and short period oscillatory movements, you know, socio-political, economic, whatnot, that give us a, a fugoid wave, if you will. They have varying periodicity, and they're very poorly damped. They're, tamped by, they're damped largely by a political process, depending on what the nature of the country is, where you either have a direct leadership that has forceful leadership in authoritarian societies, or in societies where you have electoral government, you know, it's much, it's, uh, much looser, if you will. But the most important thing is, if you're going to try to maintain uh, some sort of stability, you have to have an active participation, either the leaders or, in the case of democracies, the democratic populations that make up those societies. And as a result, since they are unstable, you find that just like an aircraft, just like that, that uh, uh, divergent longitudinal pitch that Javier showed us so dramatically with the camel this morning that he had to do an abrupt uh, pushover on, they can depart from unexpected inputs. And so we had an unexpected input 100 years ago this month, and that was one uh, where we had a classic example of a terrorist with a simple weapon utterly transform the nature of, of subsequent uh, society. What exactly was, uh, was the nature of that? Well, basically, if we take a look at the outcome of the First World War, although the nations survived, I would say that largely European society collapsed. It collapsed into economic ruin, a ruin that it's really, in its own way, still digging out from because there were cascading effects, not least of which was World War II. We saw the rise of the United States largely because we were untouched. We had people that uh, served in the war. We took a, a large number of casualties. We had a material effort that had to go toward that war, but we did not suffer the economic dislocation that you suffered if you were, say, French or Belgian or German or Italian or British. 
We had, because of the breakdown in the social order, we had unconstrained isms. And some of these, some of these were encouraged by the nations at war themselves. We, we must remember it was the Germans, for example, who sent Lenin to the Finland station to help foment revolution in Russia. Both sides tried to play the Islamic fundamentalist card. Both sides tried to work with Islamic fundamentalist movements to have the other side declared uh, uh, an infidel uh, and thereby raise the, the specter of a holy war, a sanctioned holy war. But we came out of the, uh, the First World War with populations that were extremely discouraged. They were extremely uh, unhappy at their national histories and their national leadership. And so we saw then the rise of dislocating movements in the, in the interwar period that really were profound. Fascism, communism, Nazism, uh, to just give a few. If we take a look at the fallout, the cascading effects of all of these and what some of those led to in terms of other conflicts, we have about 200 million dead that basically come out of this process. And I would argue we're still actually uh, within this conflict and, and the, what we're seeing in the Middle East or what we're seeing in the Ukraine or what we're seeing we saw in the 1990s in the Balkans really still resemble in many ways the resonant waves of it. Indeed, I would say the World War I is our Peloponnesian War. Just as you had a break in the Peloponnesian War before it broke out again, think World War I, World War II, uh, I think we're in that, uh, in that situation today. The bottom line is that we have to recognize the society's natural norm, at least in my, in my Thomas Hobbesian uh, redux view, is dynamic instability. And war is an uh, unavoidable manifestation of this. We are foolish if we think we can prevent and eliminate it. The best we can hope for is to control and contain it. And if we think that rational societies might be much better than some of the so-called irrational models, we, we only have to look at the history of some of those rational societies found on materialistic constructs or utopian constructs. And I would argue that if you take a look at, at communism, fascism, and Nazism, you have three classic examples right there, you find that they're at least as much prone to violence, and I would argue in some cases more prone than traditional ones. So the legacy of the Great War, I think, will be continued violence violence for a very long time to come, and truly, as the old statement goes, only the dead have seen the end of war, and I think we can continue to expect conflict for quite some time to come. Uh, now, on that, on that less than happy note, let's take, a look, let's take a look at some other things. First of all, within that same century, the same century of dislocation, we've had some really extraordinary things that by and large have greatly benefited humanity. We had the aerospace revolution. We have flight now that's ubiquitous, hundreds of millions of people a year flying globally, uh, uh, and of course, routine access to space. Think about, think about how space dependent we are. Our weather, our communications, our navigation, our intelligence. Storms no longer sneak up on, on this country because of space-based weather. Our communications are all enhanced by space. Uh, medical revolution, a lot of this has come out of the aerospace revolution, you know, the medical imaging systems that we have today, a propulsion revolution that has transferred itself directly into mobility, if we take a look at the ease of movement we have uh, around the world, really. And then a knowledge and computational revolution. And we have seen this knowledge and computational revolution really grafted together. You know, we've seen the electronic revolution increasingly grafted to the classic revolution in flight sciences, aerodynamics, structures, propulsion, and controls joined to, to the electronic revolution. It's really transforming. Uh, it's transforming everything. Now, when I say that, that's not necessarily positive. You know, if you take a look at some of these technologies, depending on who's using them and the intent of them, that may not necessarily be a good thing. But if we take a look at just this one aspect, you know, if we just take a look at the aerospace aspect, I would argue that if we did not have the electronic revolution, that would be the most remarkable record of technological development over a 100-year period that has ever been seen. It's really extraordinary uh, when you take a look at that, that you think if we look at rates of mobility, we ended the 19th century at six miles an hour, the speed of an, of an animal-pulled vehicle. We ended the 20th century at 60 miles an hour, the speed of a steam locomotive. We ended the 21st century at 600 miles per hour. You know, if you plot that the semi-log fashion, you get a nice little straight line, and it leads towards 6,000 miles an hour. 
uh, by the time we enter the next century. And if you think that's fanciful, I would argue that had the Wright brothers gone into President uh, Taft and said that you'd have people flying through the air at 600 miles an hour and you'd be carrying hundreds of millions of them through the air by, by the 2008 or 2009 time period, 100 years after they demonstrated their airplane publicly, they probably would have been taken over to St. Elizabeth's. I happen to believe we do have that 6,000 mile future and that's why my email is Dr. Hypersonic, thank you very much, at AOL.com. Okay, but, but I digress. Now, let's take a look at uncertainty and in military innovation. Uh, military innovation, you know, we, we love this word innovation. I, I actually prefer the word invention. I think it's more important to invent something. I recognize that if you invent something and you really work with it, then you can innovate and, and work with something else. We have a, a view that innovation tends to be positive. By and large, that's true, but we have to recognize that innovations always produce unanticipated as well as anticipated outcomes. And what these do is they overturn normative practices, the normal way in which things are done. And that, getting back to this theme of uncertainty, or sub-theme of uncertainty that I'm running, uh, really adds to, rather than decreases, uh, uh, the situation. So, let's take a look, not at the aeronautics world, but let's take a look at something that was happening just in the decade before the First World War. Jackie Fisher, a profound naval leader, a great thinker, a fan of air power, incidentally, at the end of his days. Um, Jackie Fisher is ch charged with uh, maintaining British naval superiority. And you have some interesting developments that are coming along in fire control, centralized uh, control of naval artillery, uh, steam turbine propulsion, uh, new ways of making very high strength steels, a better appreciation of hydrodynamics and hull form. And so he puts this all together, uh, together with some folks, and they come up with a battleship that its name became an exemplar of an entire class of vessels, and you have HMS Dreadnought, which appears in 1906. It immediately uh, revolutionizes naval design. Britain, the most powerful navy in the world, now is poised to be even more powerful because of this ship. Admiral Tirpitz in Germany, whose fleet at that point is basically, if you will, coastal defense force, Admiral Tirpitz thinks, ah, the dreadnought. The dreadnought puts all other ships to shame, and Britain only has one. We can engage in a naval rivalry. And so what happens is that you get, instead of, of this superiority, you get a, a naval uh, rivalry that eventually uh, leads within a decade to a uh, climatic naval battle in the North Sea, the Battle of Jutland, that, Britain, uh, that Germany comes within a hair, really, of, of utterly winning. It actually sinks more tonnage than the Royal Navy does. Uh, and I think an example today, if we carry this forward into the present uh, day, today would be the remotely piloted aircraft or the drone. You know, with the development of drones, drones are something that anybody can do. I was amazed. I was at uh, the Brunei Defense Exposition a few years ago in Brunei, and I looked around, and if I had about uh, a couple of billion dollars, which many places have, you could put together an air defense network that would take NATO to crack. And I, I also looked around and realized there's a lot of people that are evincing interest in remotely piloted vehicles, and uh, that, revolution, that revolution is well with us. Well, getting back to World War I, I think one thing that World War I teaches us, certainly in terms of the use of, of military technology in the mechanized age, is that even immature, uh, innovative systems transform the operational constructs, practice, and influence the strategic outcomes. The thing that's uh, very interesting to me is the European militaries on the eve of the First World War had very little idea of the power of the technology that they had available to them to prosecute war. They had very little idea, frankly, of the misery that they could inflict on each other and the tremendous cost that this war would generate. Many of them had strongly colonial backgrounds. Their mindset uh, still favored colonial tactics, still favored large operations in the open, still favored operations by dense masses of troops. They did not appreciate the power of artillery. They did not appreciate the power of the machine gun. And for those at sea, they did not appreciate the power of this new thing called the submarine, did not really appreciate the power of these little put uh, sputtering things in the sky called airplanes and they had no comprehension of the tank. And yet if we take a look at World War I, the submarine, the airplane, and the tank, the machine gun, of course, as well, 
radically transform military uh, operations. Now these military innovations can be really, really neat and really, really valuable, provided you get past the skeptics. At an air show in France in 1910, Ferdinand Foch made this comment in response to a journalist question, aviation has zero value for the Army. Now, Foch was not a stupid man. He was actually probably the most gifted strategist of his time. He was head of the, the French War College at the time that he wrote this. Uh, very soon, he would be a French army commander of one of their armies uh, in the opening stages of the First World War, and then, and then ultimately, of course, he would be the, if you will, the generalissimo of, of uh, allied forces. And he became a true believer in air power. Uh, the exposure of air power made him, uh, to air power, what it could do, made him a true believer. But if a person like this missed the significance of aviation, it's not surprising that many others did as well. Pre-war maneuvers had indicated that aircraft did have some value, potential value, as observational platforms. And as a result, on the eve of the First World War, if you total up, now numbers are, numbers are suspect. You have to be very careful, as John well knows, the numbers that you go to. But if you take a look at the, the organizational documents and the table of allowances, if you will, the various, the various combatant powers, you find that roughly speaking, they had between 900 and 1,000 aircraft uh, nominally uh, available in 1914. How many of those were actual operational flying aircraft is a very, very different thing, probably, probably uh, between a third and a half. But if we take a look at this, you know, everybody basically has airplanes in 1914. This just shows kind of like a classic group, you know, every combatant uh, force had them. And they were already experimenting with things like aerial photography, wireless use of aircraft, and things of this sort. What's truly extraordinary to me is that if we take a look at the history of military reconnaissance and overhead imaging and flight systems, the first use that we put the balloon, the airplane, and the Earth satellite to was in fact reconnaissance. And it's because reconnaissance knowledge, what we term intelligence surveillance reconnaissance today, or ISR, is what we really need to know. You know, Wellington said he had spent all his life wondering what was over the next hill. Well, the balloon, the airplane, the observational satellite, the drone today gives you that ability. <clears throat> What's really interesting is that within the first month of the war, we have the two great shaping battles. <coughs> we have the two great shaping battles of that conflict determined in large measure by the products of aerial reconnaissance. Now, this is not to say that there were not other sources of information. For example, at the Battle of Tannenberg, uh, in late August of uh, 1914, the Germans have access to some signals intelligence information. They have, uh, you know, they have access to the conventional use of cavalry forces on the ground. But both strategic intent and operational and tactical indications of Russian movement and intent is given to the Germans on a persistent basis by the use of air reconnaissance. And if you take a look at the reports in the Reichsarchiv, the official histories uh, indicate this. It's very interesting to go through there and see how the reconnaissance reports coming in greatly, uh, greatly influenced the conduct of that campaign. You had uh, General Matos, the 15th Corps commander for the Russian Second Army, Samsonov's Russian Second Army, which was clobbered, uh, say the enemy aviators observed us with impunity. Interestingly enough, even though the Russian uh, military had aircraft available to them, the operational philosophy of both Renenkamp running the first army and Samsonov running the second was not really to use their airmen. And they made very, very little use of their airmen in, the ta in Tannenberg and paid the price accordingly. On the Mon, uh, in, in the case of the Mon, from Mons onward through the Mon, you had persistent allied exploitation of the air weapon to determine uh, German course intent and movement. Uh, the, the first payoff came when British aerial French and British aerial reconnaissance uh, confirmed a weakness in the position of von Bülow's uh, second army that permitted an attack on it by, uh, by uh, Lanzarax fifth French army, shortly before he was sacked, interestingly enough, that put von Bülow so off his game that he immediately called out 
to von Kluck running the first army for help, and that starts the, the process whereby eventually they shift their line of march from the southwest to the south and then eventually over to the southeast. Then you have air reconnaissance spot the shift of the southeast. And air reconnaissance over several days confirms it. What's interesting is that the French Sixth Army intelligence staff with old think convinced that they have to get intelligence through cavalry, reject the reports of their airmen. 24 hours are lost. And then finally, when the report is delivered to Galliani, the military commander of, of Paris, being an astute fellow, he immediately orders for the morning of September 4, mass aerial reconnaissance. And that mass aerial reconnaissance sets the stage so that you have Joffre ordering the attacks that eventually lead to the Battle of Le Mans, which actually, when you look at it, is actually a lesser battle than it is an engagement in which the Germans choose to withdraw for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that a staff officer, lieutenant colonel, in the intel staff of German higher headquarters sent to, uh, on, a, on a staff assistance visit, always a bad word, if you will, uh, in military terms, uh, sent down to the Second and First Army is delayed on the road by a sporadic air attack. We don't know who did it. Was it a British airplane? More likely it was a French airplane. It was probably just a single bomb or two. And it so unnerved him that he saw a disaster unfolding before his very eyes and invoking the authority he had of the German chief of staff who, who had given him the power to do this and playing on von Bülow's own uh, uh, weaknesses and timidity, uh, ordered a withdrawal. And so you have von Bülow withdraw, Kluck is ordered to follow, and th that's the end of the war and movement. And you have four years of misery as a result. What I thought was very interesting, looking at the quotes here, is that you have two confirmed ground officers here, admittedly both, Br both British, the kind of individuals you would not expect to be positive in their uh, thoughts of, uh, of aircraft, and yet they are. Uh, Sir Horace Smith Dorian's military experience went back to the Zulu Wars. He had fought at Omdurman. And he says, our aeroplane officers are real heroes and bring back quite invaluable and what always proves to be true information. Boy, was he ever fooled. But it's interesting that he thought that, at least. And then Henry Wilson, uh, commenting on, on actions by the German airmen, said German artillery was extremely well served by aeroplane reconnaissance. And this goes to the heart of what John said, which needs to be reinforced. And that is, the greatest value of the aircraft in the First World War was in observation, because observation gave you targeting. And then the next greatest value was in the control of barrage fire, control of artillery. And so it's the observation aircraft and it's the artillery control aircraft that are running the war. And uh, that, uh, I think, is highlighted then by, um, by this statement that we see then from Foch in November 1916. Remember, just 10 years before, he's dissed aviation. Well, he's not dissing aviation now, uh, quite clearly. Uh, he, sees it, he sees it as the vital, uh, the vital nexus, if you will, for ensuring victory uh, in, in war. Now, I don't want to take uh, a whole lot more time, but I'll just run through a couple of things. First of all, if we take a look at air power writ large, 20th century air power, the roles and missions that air power accomplishes today, with the exception really of air transport and air mobility, the roles and missions of air power were really defined, enunciated, and exploited by airmen in the First World War. We did have some special operations. We had agent insertions behind the lines, agent extractions behind the lines, things like that. But it's very, very interesting when we take a look at this, particularly if you take a look at maritime attack. Uh, Carrier operations, you have a carrier operation where the British launch camel, uh, camels, navalized camels with bombs to go out and bomb German airship sheds, which they do successfully at Tondern. Uh, you, you know, you take a look at this and you realize that this was a war of much greater complexity than, uh, than we tend to think. Now, the, John has, has hinted at this, and uh, some people mentioned it earlier, and that is, where were we? Uh, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting point. You know, I, I uh, am fond of throwing this picture up because it kind of shows the problems with American aviation. We invented the airplane in 1903. By 1908 and 9, we had lost control of it. Um, I think in large measure, I, I hate to say this, I think we lost control of it because of the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers knew how to invent the first airplane. They really didn't know how to go beyond their initial design concept. Right up to the very end of their work, 
there were still there were still design elements in their aircraft that that were overly adaptive of previous design practice. Worse, when they were confronted with more skilled rivals, instead of recognizing that the way you win the battle for technology is by winning it in the marketplace, they decided we can win it in the court. And all that happened out of that was a huge and innovating patent fight, which meant that American aviation, to a very large degree, stalled. I find it very instructive that if you take a look at the history of the Curtis Jenny, probably the iconic American airplane of the World War I time period, you find that that was an aircraft designed by a British engineer imported to America by Glenn Curtis to develop a trainer using the latest European design standards in an aircraft. And he does this a decade after we ostensibly had invented the airplane. In 1912, we had this embarrassment where you had uh, the Depot de Zan Be uh, racer by Louis Bechereau come to this country, and it was uh, paired up against the so-called Wright Model D Speed Scout. Actually, the Speed Scout never actually took to the air. But as you can see, in a basic performance sense, uh, there was a clear outclassing there. John has pointed out, quite rightly, that if you take a look at the Allied effort, uh, the Allied air war, uh, could not have been won without the contributions of France. France rocked. It came out of World War I as the major aeronautical power. The lesson there, the larger historical lesson is, what happened to them over the next 20 years? They destroyed that lead. They fell apart so that by 1939, they were a target, uh, not a leader. Um, we had this interesting quote from John Pershing, if you read his 1919 final report of operations uh, that he submits, he, he summarizes it very well. In aviation, we were entirely dependent upon our allies. Can't, can't really get beyond that. What is very interesting is to take a look at the technological change that took place in the First World War. Put, put uh, in simplistic terms, at the beginning of the war, the performance of the typical aircraft was somewhat like an ultralight today. The early reconnaissance aircraft that I showed you were not armed. Uh, that, came, that came in the 1915-1916 time period as they became more powerful. But in August of 1914, if there, was an, if there were weapons on the airplane, it was a pilot's sidearm or maybe a rifle or a carbine or something like that. But over the First World War, if we take a look at one category of aircraft, the, the one that tends to exemplify the highest standards of, of aircraft design, uh, the fighter airplane, we find, in my view at least, that there's five generations of fighter aircraft in the First World War. The fifth generation are exclusively German. They're all metal, uh, cantilever, uh, monoplane airplanes, and they're basically the aircraft of Hugo Junkers. Uh, we can extend beyond that to look at some of the flying boat work of, of Claude Dornier, some of the biplane work of Dornier, and even uh, Junkers himself, you know. But basically, it's the all-metal revolution is there. In between, you've seen the fighter go from an aircraft of pre-war design, modified for military use, to pre-war aircraft intended for military use, to in 1916 the appearance of aircraft that are designed on the basis of combat lessons learned, a classic example being the Albatross family. Uh, in 1917 we start to see the introduction of the first fourth generation airplanes which are swing roll aircraft capable of doing an air to air, air to surface mission. That's when we start to see the emergence of the aircraft as a ground attack machine. And then finally in 1918 you have the emergence of the all metal airplane. It's significant to think that, as I said, at the beginning of the First World War, you had this ultralight type little buzzy thing flying around, uh, something like the, the, uh, the Taub that's so beautifully recreated in this museum. And in 1919, you have three flights across the North Atlantic. That, I think, speaks very powerfully to the nature of aircraft design uh, in that time period. John has talked about the, the advantages of the D-7 with its thick wing. The D D-7's advantages were so pronounced that it was the only aircraft specifically mentioned in the Versailles Accords that uh, had to be given up. 143 eventually came to the United States, something of, of that sort. Many others went here, there, and everywhere. It served in many air arms after the First World War as well. Germany led the, uh, the scientific study of flight in the World War I time period. Flight from the time of Da Vinci up to about 1905 or 6 had really been largely bird imitative. That's why people had these thin wing sections. That's why they adopted plan forms that resonated and looked very much like bird-like plan forms. 
But then you had the application, largely at Göttingen University, you had the application of applied mathematics to fluid dynamics, largely the work of Felix Klein and Ludwig Prantl. And coming out of that, together with some of the work that was taking place in structures, you had then the makings for revolution. You had the development of circulation theory where people understood in a much more complex way how air circulates around an airfoil. You have the development by Treffitz of mathematical profiling of airfoils that so that you can mathematically lay out the profile of an airfoil. You're not simply guesstimating it. And out of that, you came a family, uh, came a family of airfoils that were of increasingly high performance. It showed that you could have a thick airfoil that had very good lifting properties. More significantly, with a thick airfoil, you could now put this bracing structure, this truss structure that you had had to have with the biplane, you could compress this down and put this in the airfoil itself. Hence, you could have the cantilever airplane. And so the Greatest, uh, the greatest technical exploitation that you see take place after the First World War in aeronautics is the, the global spread of German aerodynamics. It's, uh, it's spread largely by the United States bringing Max Munk, one of, of Prontel's leading students, to the United States to head up airfoil research for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. While he's there, he creates the variable density wind tunnel, which creates a whole new family of airfoil shapes, starts a whole new process of airfoil design. And the way we can measure the significance of that is to point out that in the Battle of Britain in 1940, the Messerschmitt 109, the Messerschmitt 110, the Spitfire, and the Hawker Hurricane all used American airfoil shapes, not British or German ones. Uh, now, if we, um, if we take a, a look, you know, at this, uh, basically, what does this, uh, what does this exemplification of German advancement look like? Uh, well, here it is. You know, this is a Junkers ground attack aircraft, the CL-1 of 1918. Very few get to the front uh, before the end of the war. Too little, too late. They do fight on with the Fry Corps and things like this uh, afterwards. More significantly, in one year's time, Junkers introduces the J-13, which becomes the F-13 airliner, a profoundly influential and significant aircraft that is a all-metal, low-wing, cantilever transport. And he does this 15 years, basically 16 years, after the invention of the airplane at Kitty Hawk. That is how rapid we're seeing the technological transformation of flight, uh, and of course that sets us up then for another symposium we'll have to have at another time, namely the development of aeronautics in the interwar period. Thanks very much.